or suicide bombers. Could never imagine a Nigerian uh, uh, terrorist. I used to say that Nigeria is also so blessed with abundant rain and fertile soil that we had no excuse for not being more productive than countries with droughts, earthquakes, and floods. But I don't say these things anymore. I have seen Boko Haram become one of the most destructive terrorist organizations, displacing millions of Nigerians and wreaking havoc in the northeastern part of Nigeria. And I have seen floods destroy homes, livelihoods um, in Nigeria, now on a much more regular basis. Both Boko Haram and now the regular destructive flooding have their roots in rapid environmental degradation in the country. The shrinkage of watersheds, the destruction of trees, the drying up of Lake Chad in northeastern Nigeria, and the destruction of livelihoods have created fertile soil for terrorism and destroyed natural safety barriers that prevented natural disasters. In Africa, we have the fastest growing population in the world that will put pressure on our natural ecosystems like never before. If we do not understand the linkages, have clear plans and programs, the natural disasters and human catastrophes will be on a scale we have never seen before. Conservation of critical ecosystems must be the centerpiece of any responsible African government and supported fully by the African business community as well. <clears throat> the problem often with conservation rhetoric is that ha it has been dominated by well-meaning foreigners and never really championed by African leadership. Too often the logic is driven by sentiment, how sad it would be if a certain species of frog no longer existed. Um, and how sad it would be if our children couldn't enjoy the same safari holiday we did. Um, if you mix that with the whole animal rights groups and biologists, you have a recipe for rhetoric and agenda that does not resonate with many Africans. I believe that the preservation of ecosystems, watersheds, and habitats on which African people depend is why African leaders must champion this cause. It's about the well-being of Africans, not just the well-being of animals in Africa. <clears throat> I would like to give you um, an example of this, um, and it's a little bit about the work that we're currently doing in Nigeria. Um, there's a park in Nigeria that no one has ever heard of before. It's the, it's the largest national park in Nigeria. It's called Gashaka Gumti National Park. I hope that you will, all the people in this room, in 10 years from now, you will all remember this name. <clears throat> I learned about this park from conservationists in London. I'd never heard about it from anyone in Nigeria, and I have yet to meet anyone in Nigeria who has ever heard of this park, let alone been there. Over the past couple of years, I have been there a number of times. Um, part of what has protected the park is that it is very difficult to get to. Um, um, it, uh, there's a road that comes part of the way into the park. Then you n must go by canoe. Um, and then to get to the really good parts of the park, you need to walk for three or four days. There's no tourism accommodation, um, so you take your food and your accommodation uh, to reach the best bits. Um, what we did was we, um, uh, one of the times that I went in the park, I took some drones um, without permission, so this is all illegal footage that I'm gonna show you. Um, and we took uh, some drone footage just to show what the park looks like. And then what we also did was we interviewed someone who was involved with setting up the park, is an ex-WWF person called Richard Barnwell, um, who was actually involved with the initial setting up the park. It's just a two-minute short little video clip, but I want to use it to illustrate a point. Arriving in Abuja, you immediately thrown into this vast multitude of people, very heavy traffic on the road. And then you have to travel down. It takes something like 12 hours on the road. But 
On that journey, you're struck by how populated Nigeria has become. New villages, people going about daily activities. And then when you get into the park itself, you're in another world. And you're in this extremely tranquil, peaceful world. You wouldn't believe that Nigeria had a quiet corner like this. As soon as I arrived there, I, I, it struck me that I'd, I'd arrived in, in a real wilderness. Full of woodland, forests, rivers, uh, an ecosystem that has changed very little for thousands of years. It, it is really a, a superb, untouched wilderness. Increasingly difficult to find in this um, busy world of ours. I've been in, in other conservation areas all over Africa and I've, I've never found the same diversity of ecosystems as I found in Kashaka. See, you had uh, Guinea savanna woodland, which is an open sort of orchard woodland. You had forest going in the higher altitudes, going up into montane forest. The highest mountain in Nigeria is there within the park. Chapel Wadi, which goes up over, over 7,000 feet. But then the animals, you've got the heart of beast, cob, bushbuck, giant forest hog, red flank diker, golden cat, leopard. In the forests, a fantastic array of primates and chimpanzees. So in terms of Nigeria's national heritage, I think it's, it's the most important area of Nigerians can, can go in there and see an area of land that, that would have resembled something that, that, that their forefathers might have known thousands of years before. So that's, that's the park. Um, <clears throat> now this park, um, a conservationist, a sentimental conservationist uh, would tell you that this has the largest population of chimpanzees in West Africa. And this is the reason why we should preserve this park. Uh, a sentimental conservationist would tell you that this is one of the most biodiverse rainforests, um, montane rainforests in the world, um, with many yet to be discovered species. Um, a well informed African leader would tell you that this park is the watershed and the source of the Benue River, which forms part of the Niger Benue River system, the largest river system in West Africa and that if this watershed is destroyed, then the livelihoods of over 10 million people who depend directly and indirectly on this park will be destroyed. And if this happens, it will make Boko Haram and the current African refugee migrant crisis look like child's play. So I have become involved with conservation for sentimental reasons, um, but I am here because of the compelling logic of why conservation should be at the top of every African leader's agenda. So that's, that's a little bit about um, how I got involved in conservation. Um, and 
I would like now to talk a little bit about the topic that I was supposed to talk about. Um, so I have some modest observations from the perspective of a financial investor um, about uh, conservation. <clears throat> so I would say one of the things I've learned uh, about establishing conservation enterprises is that it's a lot easier to establish conservation enterprises in Kenya than it is in Nigeria. No surprises there. Um, I think if we explore why, um, it is illuminating. Um, so what does, a, what does an investor need? <clears throat> an investor, first and foremost, needs some degree of law and order and effective conservation. Um, no law and order, um, very little investment. It's as simple as that. People don't want to risk life and limb for their work or, nor for their holidays. Um, in Kenya, um, the area that we have invested um, is a private conservancy. Um, it's about 40,000 acres on its own, interconnected with another couple hundred thousand acres. On the 40,000 acres, there are 120 well-equipped rangers who work closely and constructively with communities, so poaching incidences are very rare indeed. In Nigeria, in that national park, which is approximately two million acres, there are 200 ill-equipped rangers with no functioning radio system, uh, with one vehicle, um, and uh, massive amounts of bushmeat poaching um, with illegal logging and illegal mining in the rivers, armed banditry, um, and, and limited uh, judicial and community engagement. Uh, we currently have had to work closely with the army in order to be able to be, uh, support the rangers and also in order to be able to move in and out of the park. Um, clearly, this is not something that is a long-term solution. Second thing that is necessary for most private sector investors is infrastructure support. And when I say infrastructure support, I mean uh, good immigration rules, processes, and infrastructure, um, airstrips, travel agents, ground handlers, um, um, and the ability to deal with tourists coming in and out of your country um, in an efficient and in friendly fashion. Um, needless to say, Kenya is well versed in this. Um, in Nigeria, if you come and you say that you're coming for tourism, you're generally viewed with suspicion. Um, and uh, the visa process has uh, a long way uh, to go in terms of uh, making it easy for tourism. So it's, again, it's something that we need to build before, uh, uh, before private sector investment in ecotourism can come. Thirdly, and very importantly, is the ongoing support of communities and the government itself. One thing for sure is that in the investment process, the execution is the difficulty. There's no shortage of opportunity. There's a shortage and a difficulty in execution. And almost inevitably, you will be relying at some point in time on support from the government and support from communities. And having them understand what you're trying to achieve and supporting your goals is essential. Um, these very big differences between Kenya and Nigeria has meant a, a fundamentally different approach. Um, so in Kenya, um, I invested straight away pretty much. Um, the difficulty in Kenya is actually that Kenya is a pretty crowded and competitive market when it comes to tourism. So we focused on a particular niche. Uh, uh, private home lodge with um, exclusive occupancy. We focused on architecture and design um, and, and pulling uh, 
um, high value tourists into an area that would serve as a base for adventure um, and a wellness and fitness aspect in order to try and make a, a distinctive product that is different from uh, what is the norm in Kenya. Um, so the, the, the challenge in Kenya is that it's, it's a competitive market. The challenge in Nigeria is, is entirely different. Um, the prerequisites to be able to sit a, a tourism product uh, are not there yet. So our focus has been um, establishing not-for-profit uh, organization um, and working very closely with the National Park Service um, to mobilize funding into training, ranger training, capacity building, community engagement, um, and infrastructure such as airstrips and uh, beginning baseline research so that we can measure success in the future. We've partnered with international conservation organizations um, and we have, we're using this project also as a means to try to mobilize support from the local business community. Um, this is a long-term 10-year project. Um, um, it is not something uh, that we can do I I overnight. A second observation by a financial investor um, uh, generally about conservation is um, I, I fundamentally believe that um, ecotourism and small micro enterprise is not the only way um, and is insufficient uh, for conservation. There are precious ecosystems that are not necessarily tourist attractions. Um, they may ge never generate sufficient return to cover the cost of conservation. I've seen a number of instances um, in uh, Kenya in particular where tourist camps are being set up in areas with marginal wildlife or natural resources and I believe that they will struggle to compete uh, in the long run. Um, I'm struck also by the number of very small enterprises with uh, difficulty that will have difficulties in scaling up. Um, and uh, what I think is that uh, governments and conservationists and, organize, and the private sector should look at uh, things uh, above and beyond tourism. Um, in Gashaka, we are looking hard at things such as uh, uh, certain sustainable plant products, uh, shea butter in particular. Okay. I've been asked to wrap up, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to quibble with that. Um, so, uh, two more points. Uh, one is diversification away from conservation, uh, uh, diversif diversification away from tourism, and uh, looking at uh, inputs for the pharmaceutical sector, um, looking at micro hydro, looking at real estate development in certain areas. These are things that we're, we are looking hard at. Um, Third observation, which relates to my final observation, um, I think the, one of the biggest challenges we have, and I think this is one of the key things at a conference like this, is to mobilize substantial capital. One needs enduring, transparent partnerships with government. Um, so uh, the government uh, lacks the resources to be able to provide all for conservation, and so partnerships both with NGOs but also with the private sector is going to be fundamental. Um, I would like to end with a note of optimism. In my view, um, the capital that is available for conservation is going to grow dramatically over the next few years. Um, with climate change becoming big on the global agenda and with the increase in impact investing, the capital is there, impact investment capital is over $500 billion already and doubled last year alone. What this means is that the challenge is not going to be availability of capital. The challenge is structuring investable uh, uh, units that are able to attract the capital in the long term. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Philip. But I'm beginning to hear the point about ownership coming through once again. And conservation needs to be the occupation of everyone. Now, the economic, the socio-political, the 
ecological aspects of creating thriving, sustainable ecosystems, perhaps an analogy would be to think of the three pillars as the three-legged stool that we all know, a powerful symbol across the continent, carved from one block, as you all are, irrespective of leanings, yet serving a central purpose, a seat on which generations of all living things can build upon. So what is the opportunity at hand? It's a question Maxwell Gomera, director of the Biodiversity and Ecosystems Branch of UN Environment, will help to unpack together with our panelists. Welcome, Maxwell. Thank you very much. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, even for those of us who are one step removed from nature in our present day lives, looking back at the places we called home as we were children can reveal disturbing truths. This is certainly true for me. I grew up in a small mining town in here in Zimbabwe called Kadoma. Like many children my age, I looked forward to school holidays. It was the end of homework. Unlike many children my age, my parents would bundle me off to Mondoro, a rural area to the east. There I headed Ketro on the quintessential African savanna. I loved being in Mondoro. In its river, I learned to swim and to catch fish. I had my first adolescent crush on a girl in Mondoro. <laughs> the surrounding forests were lush, teeming with wildlife. The rivers were bountiful, full with fish, and foul in pure fresh water. City folk were happy to go to Mondoro because they would come back with their hands full of the gifts that they got from the rural areas. But today, my village in Mondoro is heartbreaking. The lush forests and the wildlife are gone, replaced by dry fields. The river is dry. I now take my own food and bottled water when I visit Mondoro. And worst of all, the people of Mondoro are poor and have very few, if any, options for bettering their lives. Now, tragically, the story of Mondoro is not just unique to my village. It is a story that I found in my present capacity to be one that's shared across Africa. Thousands of villages across Africa are suffering the worst impacts of climate change, of population growth, and of poor developmental choices. To feed themselves and generate cash, farmers like those of Mondoro are expanding their crops onto wildlife lands and bringing them and their families into dangerous con conflict with wildlife, while at the same time destroying the forests and the wildlife that is the source of their bounty. This expansion continues. But I've also learned in my present capacity that this is not an inevitable outcome. And my panel today is going to share with you that we don't have to stay on the course that we are in today. And I'm going to invite my panel to join me. Dr. Brian Child, please come, over, come through. <laughs> Dr. Brian Child is an associate professor of the University of Florida and is also associate, associated with the African Leadership University in Rwanda and the African Wildlife Economy, please take a seat. Um, Institute in Stellenbosch. As a Rhodes Scholar and DFU Oxford, uh, he did his DFU uh, at Oxford and specialized in economics and governance of protected areas, community-based natural resources management and private conservation in Southern Africa. 
Masejo Matsuamuse, please come over. Masejo is a social and economic justice activist with over 20 years' experience. Her passion in driving the work that demonstrates is in driving the work that demonstrates the interdependence between democracy, conservation, economic development, and human rights. Welcome, Masejo. Last is Keith Vincent. Keith was educated in Zimbabwe, actually, where he developed a love for the outdoors and the natural history of the country. He became a professional guide, working throughout the country for various safari companies before settling here in Victoria Falls. Keith has been working in this space since 1980, working throughout Southern Africa, and today, he is the chief executive officer of one of the biggest companies on the continent in this space, Wilderness Safaris. Kit. Do those, do those things work? Uh, well, they do work. Okay, um, I'm going to start with a very simple question for Brian. How do we develop a large wildlife economy? This is what most people would like to hear. You know, we're talking about a wildlife economy here. How do we develop it? How do we increase it? Are there opportunities in Africa or is this something that we're just talking about? Brian. Thank you, Max, and good morning to everybody. It's been a long time since I grew up and ran barefoot on the Chobe River, just up, upstream here, when it used to take nearly a day to drive there through thick sand. Keith, you probably remember that as well. Um, I see three firsts in this, in this conference, which, which is very exciting to me. Firstly, we, I think we need to thank our political leaders, presidents and ministers for standing up so strongly for wildlife and people in Southern Africa. In other continents... And personally, I'm blown away for that. And I've been involved in wildlife conservation for 40 years in Southern Africa. And I think it's going politically stronger and stronger. Secondly, this is the first conference on African wildlife that I've ever been to that's dominated by Africans. And I find that very heartwarming. <laughs> and, and thirdly, I was at the community workshop yesterday and some of the community leaders that I was talking to are children of the people that I used to work with in villages in Masoka and Mahenya. And they are even more intelligent and even more dedicated than their parents. So for me, that also gives me the capacity that we've built in this, in this region in the last 40 years is incredible. And the young people are ready to, to take over. So, so I, I, what I want to do is talk about the wildlife economy in, in Africa. So I'm going to start way back. We evolved, human beings evolved in this continent about 4 million years ago. About 70 to 90 million years ago, we spread out over the world, and we basically wiped out the, the wildlife. With one consequence, Africa is the only continent in the world that still has all its wildlife. We're the only continent in the world where you can see 20 or 30 species at one place. You won't see it in Australia, you certainly won't see it in Europe, you even won't see it in America. But we're in a, we're in a crisis point. The world has lost 82% of its animals in the last 30, 40 years, and 2% of the biomass on this planet, 2% is wild. Africa is losing its wildlife really fast as well, not everywhere, and I believe that we, we've reached a tipping point. Either we make this into an industry um, that benefits everybody, particularly rural people, or we lose our wildlife. As someone who grew up in Zimbabwe and has worked and lived in Zambia and South Africa and Botswana, I believe that we have the solutions um, to grow a major wildlife industry. In fact, South Af Southern Africa is one of two places in the world where wildlife is increasing. In 1960, there were 2 million animals. Now there's 20 million animals. We've increased our wildlife tenfold 
in the last 40 years by adopting bold policies that most of the world doesn't agree with. But as Africans, I think we need to be proud of these policies and we need to be confident in them. But what I'm going to say today is I think we need to take them even further. The wildlife industry in southern Africa is worth about two to three billion US dollars. And um, it provides quite a few hundred thousand jobs. If you go around here or Maun or Johannesburg, you'll see people dressed in safari kit working in the wildlife industry. That didn't happen 30 years ago. But what I'm going to propose is that we're fiddling. We have a $3 billion industry. Why do we not have a $30 billion industry? I'm going to talk briefly about national parks and about communities. Now, I'm an economist, and we in Southern Africa have been promoting this idea that national parks are economic engines. I also worked in South Luangwa National Park in Zambia in the 1990s, when there was almost no economy there. I've just done a survey with my students, and that park generates $38 million. Um, it provides them, thank you, Minister of Finance probably doesn't know that it pays $6 million of taxes. And the people outside the gate, their livelihood is twice as good as people living far away from the park. So South Luangwa is a park that demonstrates that national parks create e economy. And if we go to the big brother, which is Kruger, Kruger generates about 600 to 800 million US dollars a year. That's not far off the value of the whole livestock industry in South Africa. Um, and the Ministry of Finance should be grateful for the 1 billion or 1, 1 1.5 billion rand that Kruger, that the tourists and the operators, etc., pay into the fiscus. And it also provides about 100,000 jobs in, in the in the, in the whole um, value chain. But now the negative stuff. If you look around South Africa, Southern Africa, and I'm talking Southern Africa, we can expand to Africa slightly later. There are 100 national parks. Only 10 of those are performing. So that's why I say it's very easy to grow from 2 million to 20 million just by managing our parks better. Um, if we look at our parks, I said that they earn $2 billion. American national parks, we have much better wildlife. American national parks generate $350 billion a year. Why are we, why don't we grow? I, and being in Victoria Falls, I, I just want to talk about when, what I see when I come here. The, the bridge over the, over the falls was built by Cecil Rhodes in 1902. He built that for tourism, but now what's happening is that road is being used for commercial traffic, et cetera, et cetera. And what we've got, it's like, it's like a, the shanty towns. Let's say Victoria Falls tourism is a shopping mall. It's like all the business and all the shanty towns and all the housing is moving into the shopping mall and undermining the business. So why don't we build another bridge 40 kilometers downstream? It's much quicker coming from Bulawayo anyway, and move the commercial side and turn Victoria Falls into a major industry. We have 700,000 tourists in Victoria Falls. We have 1.1 million tourists just going to the shopping center in Cape Town at the, at the waterfront. Yellowstone National Park has 6 million. Why do we allow Yellowstone to be performing seven times better than us? It's not necessary. Um, so what I'm saying is, as Africans, as Southern Africans, if we develop our national parks, we can turn us into a major, major business. And if we turn into business, we're also going to have more wildlife. Turning to communities, which is my passion, um, I was lucky enough to sit with 40 or 50 community leaders for the last day. And um, as I said before, I was blown away by the capacity that I see in the room. Sorry? I've got two more minutes. Um, as we know, most wildlife in Africa actually lives on communities' land. But I think you'll, the communities will talk to you tomorrow or later today, talking about how in the past the communities have been the losers for wildlife and they've got a raw deal. What they're going to be talking about is how do they get a fair deal or a square deal. Just to wrap up, in so what's the way forward? I believe in Southern Africa and in Africa more broadly, we need to aim to go from a $2 billion to a, to a $20 or $30 billion industry. 
And I think that before we meet again, we should have a plan, a business plan on how to do that. What investment we need, what roads we need, what policies we need, how do we get the communities involved. We need to bring it to a meeting like this for political endorsement. And as a continent, we need to share lessons amongst ourselves. As President Masisi knows so well, we are subject to a lot of shrill and passionate criticism, unfortunately backed by often a lack of understanding. I think that, yes, of course we must fight this in the media, but what I think is that if we expand wildlife tenfold, if African communities are involved in the wildlife, if our national parks are performing at the level that I'm proposing, then I don't think anyone will criticize us because they will see what a fantastic job we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. What I was going to do was to go through another round of questions for these, guys, for these uh, panelists, but I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the last two panelists one question each, then I'll take questions from the floor. I'll take three questions for each of the panelists, for, for, for the panelists, and we'll finish off at that. The next speaker is Maseho Madzwamuse, as I said, a, a, a human rights uh, activist. And the question I asked Maseho was, you've heard Brian talk about these numbers and how we can grow wildlife economy. How do we ensure that we take everyone with us? How do we ensure that communities are part of it? Thanks, Maxwell. Dumelang, Salibonani, Magadi. Dumelang, Salibonani, Magadi. Max, you ask a very important question. Um, how do we make sure that we take everybody along uh, in this new deal for a wildlife economy? I think we take everybody along by making sure that the benefits from the wildlife economy are equitably distributed and that we are creating equal opportunities for all. I'll just start by an observation I made as we were walking in this morning. There were two queues and the ladies, we were whisked to the front and I was quite chuffed that I could go in quite quickly. And then I reflected, why is that? Why is that there is a snaking queue of men waiting to come in and the women can be quickly snicked in through. And it wasn't the ladies' first phenomenon. It wasn't because we are privileged, but it is because the very structure of the sector we're trying to transform is not creating opportunities for everyone. Where is the women professionals, the women leaders in our sector whom our universities have chanted uh, throughout the years. I think that's a fundamental question to start with. The second point to raise is one around the lived realities of the communities. These are communities, I mean, we talk about really staggering figures around the, 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 the amount of money that comes in through wildlife-based tourism. In 2016 alone, we were looking at 36.2 billion US dollars coming in through in that one year. And at the same time, if we were to do a socioeconomic mapping of the areas that are rich in wildlife and, and biodiversity, these also happen to coincide with the deepest pockets of poverty and inequality. Why is that? So if we're going to bring everybody along, it has to start with us changing the lived realities of the communities. And when we talk about the communities, who are we really talking about? We talk about the, the, uh, the tourism uh, uh, destinations largely coming to Africa, mostly driven by wildlife, because this is where the last frontiers of wildlife conservation are. That is not a coincidence. It is because communities are intricately connected with their wildlife. Many of us here, my maternal grandfather, his taught him was Tolo, um, Tolo. That connects him directly to wildlife. He was a hunter, and we ate wildlife, we ate wild meat in our home. But down in Ngoyani, where my grandfather was from, there was no extinction of wildlife per se. 
my paternal side of the family, our totem is the heart. I can't really connect it to a very specific species, but I connect it to every species. So when we talk about communities, sometimes we are them and they are us. And if we are privileged to be sitting in spaces that are shaping policies and policy outcomes, that are making decisions about development outcomes, we can reconnect with who we are and the very source of our being, our identity, and our sense of belonging. And if we can make those personal connections, we can certainly be making decisions that benefit our communities and the poor. The second point that I, the third point that I want to make is really one that is talking about reversing the alienation and the dispossession of communities from their very lands that harbor national resources, natural resources, and wildlife. And I'm talking here about restoring the land rights of communities that are stewards and custodians. Restoring land rights and restoring ownership. And perhaps going a step further with our liberation agenda and beginning to talk about economic liberation. That is about creating opportunities for communities to gain meaningful monetary benefits as well as meaningful ownership arrangements for the wildlife. So when we negotiate with capital interest, we really have to be looking at the role that the state plays in being a facilitator, a regulatory role, and one that is facilitating competing interests and acknowledging that sometimes these interests do not come from a level playing field and does not come with um, uh, equal, um, equal power. So how do we create policies that are creating opportunities and are making it possible for the economic mobility of our, of our citizens in the rural areas? How are we ensuring that the tourism sector does contribute to decent employment and decent work? If we uh, compare what we're getting in terms of the financial receipts that come out of it, this industry and the average that the labor, a casual laborer in a tourism uh, venture gets. Can we really talk about an economic just system that is delivering opportunities for all and that can lift everybody from poverty? The last point, Max, and I won't be very long, it's really a question of restoring human dignity. There is no dignity in living side by side with wildlife and generating large sums of income when you struggle to feed your family. Ask any mother, they know. Thank you. Thank you, Masejo. Um, Keith, Brian himself uh, admitted that some of the figures that he gave are for, from Southern Africa. But of course, this continent is big. Your company and your experience, you've been working across this continent. How do we take these ideas to scale? Maskati, to me, I think I'd like to start off with, I think, the success of the opportunity of today. Every president in countries we operate in are represented here today in one form or another. So I certainly feel like I'm at home. I do believe that the opportunity for this region of Kaza has never historically been in a better position to grow than it sits today. And it starts because of this political willingness and uh, unity to allow this to happen. A couple of things that have happened over the last couple of years that has really engineered some really quick growth for the economy of tourism and ecotourism at large is one is the opening of the Victoria Falls Airport. One of the, the probably the founding issues we found in going into various countries and operating in remote regions is access, international air access, and it's getting cheaper and cheaper every day. There's no doubt that tourism to Africa as a whole is growing. We need to take opportunity of that. But I also think we need to recognize, I think there's been too much historically and probably previously 
uh, emphasis from various fields where we're trying to protect an area that's ever shrinking of conservation area or wildlife area. The opportunity by including communities and including rural development into, we can increase the capacity and the opportunity, not only just for earnings in the country. And we've seen this happen. We've seen it happen incredibly successfully in Botswana. And we can copy that. We can take you to areas in Zimbabwe, and people might challenge us on this, where the wildlife today is 100 or 200% better than it was 20 years ago. We have a very well-educated workforce in the SADAC region. We need to continue to, to train, to create opportunities, and that's all easy to do today. And I think it's an opportunity, and I, I congratulate all the governments of, of SADAC to get this together, because this is the opportunity, and to quote Philip a little bit earlier, capital is readily available and more available to Africa today than ever before. In the last 35 years of operating in Africa, we've seen, we, we know that there's more money that's readily available. We need to make sustainable use of it. We need to ensure that there's equitable distribution of the earnings for the countries. We have got challenges, yes. But let's meet those challenges. But the, the opportunity sits with us today. As a tourism operator in Africa, and I'm very proud to be part of this, is let's take the necessary steps. There, seem, there is political will. Tourism's an easy game. It needs security for the tourists. It needs security of the wildlife. It needs security of the rural communities. That's all it really needs, and international air access. The rest is about marketing the destination. There's such an amazing opportunity for CASA of spreading our elephant population, which will relieve some pressure on our rural communities, especially if we can get them through a lot of our elephants through to southeastern Angola. There's an amazing opportunity, which I think would also grow uh, opportunities in the Caprivi for Namibia also into southeast, uh, southwestern Zambia, there's an opportunity, all within striking range of a central point between Kasani, between Victoria Falls. It would grow the opportunity for communities. It's a two-hour flight in a caravan from here to any one of those spots. Let's use that opportunity to engineer, to grow. It will be something that's SADAC-driven, and I think this is where we have this opportunity now, the world is looking at Africa, not only just as probably one of the leading examples of what's possible in conservation, but what's possible in sustainable, responsible development of tourism. And I really would like to, to congratulate the leaders of our countries for bringing this together. And yes, there will be dis differences of opinion, but the important part is that we stand together. We work together for the betterment of our people and one thing I'm, I'm confident of, the opportunity to lift this and scale it up, which will then add extra benefits to not only the, the GDP of the country, but rural development, rural participation in, in our countries. And I certainly, as, as, a, as a company and as an individual who's a passionate cons conservationist, believe that this opportunity is right on our doorstep and I look forward to be participating in it going forward. So to, to our great countries, well done, and I look forward to the couple of days ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. We'll take three questions from the floor. There's a gentleman over there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Emmanuel Koro. I'm based in Johannesburg, South Africa. I write on environmental issues. I'm an indigenous African who is actually very surprised and would like to know how we can meet at this summit to talk about growing Africa's wildlife economy without mentioning what my president mentioned, uh, because you cannot set an agenda for the president. That's why President Nangagwa spoke about trade in ivory, which can sustain the running of parks and all wildlife conservation in 10 years. That is, the text of this summit is silent on that. We're talking of travel, 
non-consumptive use. What is happening? And what is so new about this uh, deal? We've worked with our communities before, promoting rural development through tourism uh, enterprises. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel. I'll take another question. There's a gentleman right at the back. Hi, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Parker. I'm with Conservation International. And I think just following on from the, the previous speaker's question, um, I think there's a lot of focus on tourism that has been raised so far, and that's obviously good, and we're sitting in a tourism mecca here at Victoria Falls. But I would contest that we've got to think beyond tourism for Africa. If you look at the situation in Africa, there's 55 countries, um, of which 15 are arguably competitive from a tourism perspective. What about the other 40? And we, in those countries, Tourism is deeply dependent on many extrinsic factors like security, airlift, etc. that is not readily resolved. It takes years for those things to be fixed, but we're losing our natural capital faster than those issues will be addressed. And in the meanwhile, we've got a trajectory where 88% of the world's extreme poor living on two, less than $2 a day are living in Africa. The biggest wildlife economy in Africa is the dependence on rural people on ecosystem provisioning. And at the moment, that's an unquantified economy, and it's one that is, that is not recognized at all. And I think we have to find a way in areas where tourism is not... A, um, is not competitive and it will take time to be competitive to look at alternatives around sustainable utilization. So I'd just like to put it to the speakers is we've got to think beyond tourism uh, going forward for the, the large majority of people living in Africa and we have to empower the communities living in rural settings to become the custodians of natural capital and to benefit from the flow of revenues and ecosystem provisioning. Thank you. Right, last question. Going once, going twice. Anyone? Okay, over there. Good morning, everybody. My name is Trish, and I'm from Wildlife Direct in Africa, Kenya. So my question is to Keith. Uh, as you were finishing your presentation, there's one key thing that you spoke about, that regardless of difference of opinion, we need to work together and we need to stand together. What are the strategies and measures that we are going to be putting in place to actually move past the differences that we have to actualize something that will be of benefit to communities because in Africa, all communities have the vision of being able to be empowered to see that wildlife benefits them. What is it that we are going to be moving forward from this summit that will be able to be a reality for every community when we go back home in our countries? Very good questions. Uh, who wants to go first? Brian? So we had, we had uh, a question by Andrew Parker. Um, I think in Southern Africa, we recognize that tourism is a very lucrative industry in a very small area. But we in this region have been fighting to trade ivory and rhino horn and to make briefcases for 40 years because we've been very successful. And I completely support the president of Zimbabwe in talking about the value of these products. So one of the things we have to do is fight to keep our markets open. Secondly, and, and we, I didn't mean not to mention this, but 80% of the wildlife in Southern Africa is financed by safari hunting, not tourism. 80%. And if you go to the communal areas, certainly when I worked in Campfire and also in Zambia, more than 95% of the income from wildlife is from trophy hunting. So we're not trying to argue between hunting and tourism and products. What we're trying to do is build an industry that includes tourism, hunting, and products. All uses, the most valuable way we can use our wildlife. Thank you. Uh, 
I think from a point of view, and, I, and there's some really good examples, and I'd like to use Namibia as an example of, and in fact, two models, but Zimb uh, Namibia and Botswana. Over many, many years, CBNRM programs, and those of you who know what CBNRM programs are, there has been growth in, in the opportunity. And in Namibia in particular, we have a, a, a partnership in Tomorrowland with the local community, and that served both of us, both the community and ourselves, very, very well over the last 20 years. Uh, and it's an area that continues to flourish uh, in that part of Namibia. And Botswana has also very successfully run community-based natural resource programs in areas, and we work in a particular area which is called the Okavanga Community Trust, which is otherwise known as the Kwedi. Um, and we've worked for just over 20 years um, in that area. And what I can honestly tell you is that the relationship between the community and, and the business side is absolutely critical on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, a, it's important that, that the community understand where they are, where, the, where their earning capacity is. And you know, the other challenge we have is tourism. You know, 10 years ago, it was about creating jobs. There's one thing that when it works, we can create jobs easily. I think in today's world, we, we need to further that where it can also contribute to the GDP of the, one, the country, and two, how do we enhance with, be it capital, be it loans, be it uh, through a variety of means, the earning capacity of those communities, because they, so they have a vested community in it. And that will be a challenge, and I think it's, it's a challenge we're gonna have to work out. Um, and you know, the, so there's, we, there's models out there that are working where we can make sure that the contribution is equally split between uh, private capital, uh, government uh, capital and investment, because we do look at each other, but I think from a point of view is private enterprise mustn't look at government to say, you must just secure it. It's a case of we need to be able to co-finance it, because we cannot ask governments just to finance it all. Where we've seen in, in also in, in Namibia, with the communities, and we've seen it here in Zimbabwe on the Chilocho boundary on the southern Wangi National Park, where if you go to Ngamo Village, 60% of the employable people in Ngamo Village are employed in the photo tourism business inside Wangi National Park. The other, the other people that are, are in from those villages along the Chilocho boundary are actually working in the hunting industry on the southern side in Chilocho. So th there is, the jobs are being created, we can grow those jobs, definitely, no doubt about it. But I think it's also about sharing uh, uh, the wealth creation. How do, we, how do we share that? How do we maximize it? And how do we speed that up? And I, so I hope that answers some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you. The facilitator just said to me briefly. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, the comments that were made around uh, the need to look uh, beyond tourism. Um, I think it's uh, now commonly known that um, natural resources and wildlife in their breath are the GDP of the poor. And therefore, when we're talking about the wildlife economy and its, its transformative potential, we have to look at it from an integrated perspective. However, the point that I want to make is perhaps instead of talking about how we empower those who are living in poverty, we should be talking about how we shift the power how do we provide platforms where the poor people themselves and the communities can begin to frame what those benefits look like? What opportunities are we presenting? And perhaps if we can start thinking about those kinds of platforms, we can begin to see the, the shifts that we want to, to make. Thank you. Thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Wildlife Direct, I think the question is an important one about uh, where do we, how do we create the space for these conversations to happen? This is the reason behind the space that uh, we are co-hosting here. And the president of Zimbabwe, His Excellency Munangagwa, made the point that, you know, one size fits all is not what we are after. So we need to create the space for these conversations to happen. So that's a very important conversation. Thank you. Emmanuel, I hope you got the, the sense that this is not just about tourism. Although tourism is part of the answer, but we need to look at the whole basket of uh, solutions that constitute a wildlife economy. We will use the next two days to look into what do we mean by that and how can we make it a reality. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to thank our panelists.
and welcome the next uh, session. Thank you very much, Max Gomera, for moderating the last session. I think he deserves a round of applause. Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, distinguished guests, we come to the session that I believe is one of the most exciting sessions of this summit, the Heads of States Dialogue. It is my singular honor and privilege to invite the moderator of the session, Honorable Pahamba Shifeta, who is the Minister of Environment and Tourism, to come and lead and do the moderation for this session. Allow me, in the same breath, to invite their excellencies, the president, the heads of state and government, to once again resume their seats at the front. Honourable Minister, Honourable Heads of State, their excellencies. Thank you very much, um, Director of Ceremonies. Your Excellency, Emerson Mnangongwa, President of the Republic of Zimbabwe. Your Excellency, Hage Kengo, President of the Republic of Namibia and also the Chair of SADAC. Your Excellency, Edgar Lungu, President of the Republic of Zambia. Your Excellency, Dr. Masise, President of the Republic of Botswana, my sister here, Honorable Paul Francisco, representing the President of the Republic of Angola, Honorable Ministers, Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen. This topic is very important to this summit. And I also want to say that we are hosted by CASA. CASA is the biggest transfrontier conservation area in the world and also hosts the largest population of elephants. Uh, more than 60% of elephants in the world, they are just here here where we are. I think most of us who have seen elephants around here already. Now, there's this dichotomy of consumptive and non-consumptive utilization of wildlife. And those who believe in non-consumptive only, but those, there are those who believe in both. Now, there's an elephant, a very huge elephant in the room. And that elephant in the room is, how do we move from here? This is the first wildlife economic summit for Africa. But the question is, how do we move from here if the market is closed for utilization of wildlife to sell our wildlife products? Now, to interrogate and to find out where is this elephant hiding, in which corner of the room. I want to call upon Dr. Malan Lindike to moderate this session. Dr. Malan Lindike has been all his life, for more than 40 years, a biology, a, 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 biodiversity conservationist. He worked as a junior 
environmentalists in Namibia, and also had a sting at uh, CITES as a researcher there. Then he came back to Namibia. He has been a permanent secretary and the Minister of Environment and Tourism of Namibia. And until retired, he retired. He is not tired. He retired last year. And because of his knowledge, skills, and experience in wildlife, he, I will invite him, Dr. Malan Lindke, to come and uh, tell us where is this huge elephant in which corner of the room this huge elephant is hiding. Um, and then, of course, to hear matching order from our principals. Thank you, Dr. Mulanitke. Welcome. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, and Your Excellencies. It's uh, very intimidating to speak with, um, with uh, such important people, in our, such leaders in our region, and uh, they're even more intimidating this panel to see people in uniform sitting behind them. So if I say something wrong, I don't know what will happen. <laughs> Your Excellencies, we've heard already an excellent introduction to the issues. Um, there are so many positives. Um, one doesn't have to elaborate that, but you know, we have this astonishing biodiversity in Africa. We have a booming wildlife populations in parts of Africa. And in fact, this, is, this increase uh, is still going on. Uh, populations of important species like elephants, rhinos, lions, and so forth are increasing in a, a large part of Africa, but also declining elsewhere. We have heard of this strong community participation. This is an enormous asset. There was a time when conservation was done at the expense of local people. Now we have local people, rural communities, working with government towards conservation, and they're doing it with passion and dedication. This is an enormous positive um, for us to take into account. We've also heard we have wonderful national parks, and this is so. Africa has incredible wild places, despite all the problems that we may, may otherwise think about. We have world-class scenery, and Victoria Falls, one can't not mention Victoria Falls, but there are other places like this as well. We have world-class scenery that can actually draw in millions of people. Some of them are coming, but there are more. But there are also plenty of negatives, and this is the, the reality, and this is what political leadership will need to face up to. There's an alarming rate of land degradation in Africa. Even in Southern Africa, although we have made good advances and there's community involvement, there's still worrying land degradation, loss of wildlife habitat, transformation, as Max Gumeras so eloquently put it, um, declining productivity of the land. There's pressure on our water systems. There's diversion of water from these rural areas and these catchments to urban use, to industrial use, to massive agricultural and irrigation systems. There's deforestation happening on a massive scale um, in, in much of Africa, and all of this exacerbated by, by climate change. Now, we used to talk about our biodiversity and our tourism economy and wildlife in general as the competitive advantage that Africa has. As Brian Child said, all the other continents essentially lost most of their wildlife. Um, this happened already maybe a hundred or more years ago in Europe and North America and so on. But even recently, there were amazing figures coming out of Europe that they've lost 70% of their insects. Um, despite you know, all of the right policies and laws in place, uh, we don't seem to be able to reverse this terrible thing that is happening in the world in terms of biodiversity. 
So what is the status of Africa's competitive advantage? And it is under threat. Um, and people are asking for change. Yesterday at the community um, conference, people were pleading and asking and demanding change to the current arrangement. The current deal, the current deal is, is not working for them. We have very high community involvement in certain parts of Africa in conservation, but what do they benefit? Are they benefit sufficiently? And this is uh, far from ideal. So this, this concept emerging of a new deal, a new deal for people and wildlife in Africa. And I think this is what we want to focus also uh, discussion around. Some clues have been given already by many good speakers previously. Rights, restoration and strengthening of rights seems to be absolutely fundamental. Far better integrated land use planning. These seem to be totally essential we heard of wildlife corridors, of elephants moving from one country to the next. These things are under severe threat because we also have an infrastructure development agenda. We have an agricultural agenda. We have urban and rural development sort of competing with each other. Um, and this deal seems to be sorely lacking in dealing with all of these competing issues. So, um, Your Excellencies, I want to make it fairly um, simple. We're going to ask you three questions. Uh, I hope they are they're fairly straightforward and simple because we really want to hear from you. What, how do you um, understand and look at these huge issues? And I know very well that conservation issues not always go up to the level of, of the heads of state. There are many, many pressing um, issues that demand their attention. So here we have this incredible and unique opportunity to have heads of state listening to, all, to this conversation and hopefully seeing this opportunity and the possibility of making a new deal where both people and wildlife can benefit. The first question, and we're going to ask each of you to briefly speak on all three of the topics. And uh, towards the end, then hopefully if there's time, we can have some questions from the audience, if you would agree to that. So in light of what has been said, the first question I would like to pose is, what is your approach, what will be your approach concerning this notion of the wildlife economy and maybe adding to that this possibility of a new deal. Do you see that this could be a new strategy, a new direct direction for development in, in your countries? How would you approach that? If I can start with uh, President Masisi of Botswana. Thank you very much. I'm Your Excellency President Mnangagwa and uh, colleague heads of state, Honorable Minister from Angola, Honorable Ministers and uh, the audience, a very good afternoon. Uh, this is like the graveyard shift. But let's get into it. Um, the new deal we talk of, for us in Botswana is not only refreshing, uh, but it's very timely because we've gotten to a point or a stage where we'd want to view the wildlife economy and the communities in which the wildlife economy occurs as interconnected. We want to view them as an ecosystem. We want to be able to isolate the various aspects of the value chain and maximize the development of such. 
for the benefit primarily of our people. And so, not only because of our democratic credentials, but we are compelled by a very deep belief system that for it to be worth it, the people must benefit from it. So, you know, certain amounts of intrinsic motivation work, and part of that is enroll a population for them to be the first defenders, protectors, nurturers of that same economy. So it grows. So we're really trying to grow the, the pie, trying to grow the cake. And doing so requires a deep understanding and a commitment to the rationale for doing this. Because we come from a past where we didn't do that, or we didn't do it as well, where we parachute in those who held certain values and views about the wildlife economy, esoteric as it was, it excluded the very persons who live, lived side by side with the wildlife. And so you, you almost set up government as the keeper of the peace on a collision course with persons who are not seeing the benefit of sustaining that which you are not deriving from. So engaging people as we continue to and will continue to, forging or renewing, refreshing partnerships through the CASA as we have been doing recently. And yes, coming to this summit, which we so gladly did, is part of that journey. And so we commit to going full throttle and doing what it takes to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, Dr. Gangop, our president, my president, I had the privilege of working with him for some years. He was my Minister of Trade and Industry, and I will never, I have to say that because it's still a very important part of my life. Dr. Gangop, um, would you like to build on what uh, President Masisi just said? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, first my brother, comrade, to have invited us to be here. But my take would be a little bit different because I would like to go back to governance and new Africa we are talking about. We are seeing here the third wave of African leadership. We had the first wave of extraordinary personalities, Kwame Grumas, Sekuturez, Nyereres, Peter Mugabe, Semioma, Mandela. That's, I brought the Southern African ones too, but they were the founding fathers. But they were extraordinary personalities, big guys. Then you had a second wave, which came through the Cold War confusion. We were confused too because of that. And then we had the military coups, we had the one party states, and so on. Now, this third wave of leaders are, we are big, I am very big, you know, <laughs> physically, but I'm not big as Sam Nyoma was. So I regard our, we regard ourselves, I think, as a third wave of African leaders who will be looking at the processes, systems, and institutions. I'm raising this because the previous panel was talking about what governments can do and so on. So we are not people who have to come to work your business plans to the head of state and so on. We provide you with the processes, systems, and institutions. If they work very well, everything will follow. So that way, 
good governance, democracy you talk about, and to be sitting here like this, in the past you couldn't get that. The president must come and address and walk out. <laughs> yeah. So we, are, we are now sitting, learning from you. We have been sitting, listening the whole morning. And that's a new leadership. And with that, I will now go to the topic that already my comrade here delivered a speech on our behalf. What he said is what we want now. People have to be involved. We started the conservancies in Namibia. We said you are living with the animals. You must coexist, like we coexist in Cold War too. So they must not fight. But there is a war. Namibia has now drought. Animals are hungry, thirsty. People are hungry, thirsty. They are going to collide. Now we have to maintain peace there. But we had conservancy concept that we started in Namibia, which also the speaker earlier acknowledged that working. So people are now getting involved, and presidents are getting involved with the people by sitting down and talking to them and laughing and learning from you. That's a new leadership. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Very well said. President Manangagwa, you already indicated the roadmap in your speech, but we look forward to hearing more from you on your vision for the wildlife economy. Well, my views are that um, wildlife, in particular in Southern Africa. I understand that uh, when the Lord created the world, he also created animals of every kind, then put Adam and Eva to look after them. Southern Africa has kept that promise which God <laughs> made in the Bible. Others every, uh, elsewhere have not kept the word of God. <laughs> we in Southern Africa are ready to assist those who have not kept the word of God to redeem themselves <laughs> by us affording to trade with them. We have excess of wildlife in our region. And I think it is important that we introduce a system or regulation where we allow the free regulated trade of wildlife so that we who have kept the word of God can also assist those countries by selling to them our excess wildlife in our country for posterity tomorrow to look at these things. I think it is unfair that uh, we get punished for being good to God's promise. <laughs> uh, animal products like uh, ivory, whether I like it or not, someday the elephant will die without being poached. When it dies, the tussocks will remain there. Now, we are saying those products are valuable. Let us find a model of trade where we capacitate those countries that have kept wildlife to continue to do so by providing um, fencing, 
security, monitoring. For instance, uh, I will speak about Zimbabwe. Our forefathers were very wise. They introduced totem. I'm a lion. So I don't eat a lion. <laughs> Some of my colleagues are elephants. They don't eat. Some are zebra. They don't eat. Some are buffalo. They don't eat because that's their totem. That way we're able to conserve these animals because all the animals are shared in totems. <laughs> and today we have wildlife in our area. I'm very proud that our predecessors, as my brother has said, created the Kaza Conservancy. Angola, Namibia, Zambia, Botswana, Zimbabwe. Also, if we go down South Africa and Mozambique, are also connected. Where we have given huge space for wildlife to travel without visas <laughs> in a wide space of area. So we should be commended for that. Our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world should assist in funding to continue to preserve this situation. And in my view, I am aware of a few countries who want to now again resuscitate the uh, preservation of wildlife. Here we are. We will support them. I thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. So, an important statement through that is that Conservation of African species need to make sense in Africa. No good if they only make sense in Europe or North America or New York or London. They need to make sense here. President Lungu, um, I would very much like to hear your views as well. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start by thanking our host, uh, Comrade Idi Nangagwa. Mr. President, thank you for your generosity. Uh, and thank you also for putting the record straight, Your Excellency. I thought you were a crocodile. <laughs> I said, I'm discovering a lion. <laughs> uh, uh, the starting point, I think, is to acknowledge the fact that uh, our people have always lived with these animals. Our people have looked after these animals. They've used them in a way in the economy, uh, apart from feeding on them. Uh, that's a starting point. And once we acknowledge that point, we should find out why is it that only a few of our people, the elite, are the beneficiaries of wildlife. Uh, it is because our people have not been given space in which to participate in the wildlife economy. And I think this is very, very cardinal. Because even the problems we've had, like poaching, uh, conflict uh, between uh, uh, human and animal in terms of space, such as agricultural usage and all these things, are because of uh, uh, lack of appreciation of the benefits that come out of uh, wildlife. Our people are denied the benefits of wildlife generally, and the, as such, they cannot identify with this as an economy. And I think we have a lot to do to work together to ensure that the communities begin appreciating wildlife as a resource, which resource benefits them in their localities. And I'm glad that you brought communities, traditional leaders and others who were working with in Zambia to ensure that uh, people begin protecting this wildlife. People begin feeling a sense of ownership of this wildlife. Without that, all this talk about the ecosystem being protected will result into nothing because these animals move, like the president has said, they don't have boundaries, they don't have visas, they go to search for pasture, water, and all these things. And when we don't protect and conserve our environment, these animals will either perish from the drought or lack of food. So we need to bring on board the communities first and foremost, and then we can talk of the economy arising from wildlife. I thank you very much. 
Thank you, Excellency. You've given a very easy access now to the next um, topic, which is about communities. As I said previously, there was a time when conservation was done at the expense of communities. All sorts of terrible things happened. We, in, the, in the past, we saw communities actually being displaced to make space for national parks. They were excluded, they were treated as criminals. And even today, I must say, I have a, still a soft spot for people who end up even paying with their lives when they try to do something for themselves and their families and they are called poachers. But they are, in fact, just normal people like us who are trying to make a living. I'm not advocating for poaching at all, but there's a human dimension that we tend to forget. Your Excellencies, communities in all of your four countries have maybe a privileged situation because your governments have created policies and programs that have led to some of the most successful community conservation programs in the world, not even in the continent, but in the world. And we have seen remarkable growth of, of these programs, and they have delivered. We have seen fantastic wildlife recoveries. But yet, as President Lungu just said now, why is it then, why is it that there's still a perception, a, a concern amongst those communities that their lives have not really changed. They are not wealthy. Their livelihoods are still fairly precarious. Little benefits have to be spread amongst many, many people. So we heard also the importance of rights. Communities tend to feel, from what we heard yesterday, they have rights, but their rights are not as secure as they would like. And, and further, they seem to feel that, yes, despite their rights, there are many occasions where very important decisions are made, whether it's in CITES or at the local government level, where suddenly their rights don't matter. So there are bigger rights somewhere else, maybe in, in the UN, maybe in the international um, financial world, maybe in the NGO world, maybe in other ideologies that suddenly count more than the rights that you have granted them through your policies and your legislation. So how do we balance or find a new balance for the rights of communities and, and therefore to enhance their participation in this wildlife economy? Is it possible that we can maybe think in future that their rights should be more important than anybody else's rights when it comes to this wildlife economy. President Masisi, if I can start again with you, please. Thank you very much. Let me begin by um, asking that the rights of my Angolan sister uh, be remembered first. Thank you, Excellency. I was going to come to her at the end, but uh, since you have graciously offered her the, the floor, Honourable Minister, do you want to comment on this issue or the previous one? I can just thank you. And, and of course, uh, we are all bounded and we feel revealed when the President um, Emerson said that we are together and we are going to give support for all our those countries that we need to be aligned in a very sustainable way and manner. And this makes me to also to acknowledge, um, if I can just uh, summarize on our point of view as Angola from question one and now the comments for the second. This is the reason why SADC is the first vice president for sustainable development goals in Africa. And the reasons why we need to continue advocate our communities despite our legislation and despite what we are doing and what we are reflecting today. But I would like also to receive more guidance from the community themselves, since they speak and they already do the diversification of their own economy. We are facing a challenge as we continue to speak on their behalf. And here we say and we heard that they should be more stronger as well. So who are we? Which type of community? This is also a question that I would like to pose for ourselves for this second question. I thank you. Thank you very much.
President Nasisi, do you want to take it up? No, pardon me. I just thought uh, we had forgotten her in the first uh, line of questions. But uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. I believe sincerely that uh, community rights with respect to uh, the wildlife economy must form part of the new paradigm in terms of their assurance. And part of arriving at a determination of the minimum level of rights required would do of necessity require an engagement or engagements with those communities uh, to determine, uh, determine that. Uh, it's also useful to uh, exchange and establish some standards of methodology of engagement because you will hardly find any organization or government proclaiming not to recognize the rights of communities and yet we are where we are. And so we need to streamline this and assure communities in ways that are verifiable and part of the verifiability of that would be in the full enjoyment of those and perhaps even the questioning or um, challenge to any abrogation of rights if they are so um, abrogated. It's important for our governance systems if, for instance, we take uh, Gaza to another level in its construct. A fundamental prerequisite could be this particular level of engagement and assurance of rights of all communities of Gaza. That becomes a standard. And this might start the nudging at the development of a framework which would guide investment. If you are to be an investor here, this is the level extent of community engagement you'd be in. So a standard would be established, which may also help us in our measurement of performance. And if you really look at it, if these were to come together, ideally, for human development, this would be a wonderful way of contributing to the realization even of our SDGs. And so uh, an opportunity presents itself. We can work as individual governments, but it'd be nice if we worked as all the governments across the region and establish these as norms and standards we subscribe to. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, His Excellency Dr. Gaingo from Namibia, your, your views, please. Well, my views are clear because we have also animal rights. Those animals which are there are enjoying rights too. And some communities from Europe respect the animal rights sometimes more than the human rights. You will see that they are so concerned about elephants, about lions, uh, cheetah, and you are trying to say people who are there have rights too. And these animals are sometimes many because, as the president said, because of our good governance, because of our good conservancy uh, policies, and also preserving our animals that they multiplied and they are now many because of good management. Now when we have them, we are saying, can we use them so that people who are there with them can be protected to build good houses for them by selling some of the 
things that ought to be sold so that we can, we can benefit the communities. Because communities have the rights too. But some people really believe that animals have more rights. So what do we do? We have a crisis now in Namibia, as you know, that there is a human-animal conflict. That's a big, big problem. Now people whose millifields are destroyed by animals, by, by elephants, want compensation. Where do you compensate them from? But if you could sell some of these every, in a controlled way, use that in a kind of a rim fence way that's going to go to maintaining those people's properties, build, rebuilding their houses, building fences and so on. That could be the way we can address people's rights already, by using their own resources, animals that they live together with, but which also destroy their houses, their fields and so on. It's not easier for the national budget to always address that issue. We can also compensate them and they are fighting for that. You know it. So that's a problem that we all hold hands and see to it that uh, we benefit from our animals so that they can benefit the people. That's a, that's a very, very strong statement that the rights, the recognition of rights is not good enough if you obstruct the use of the rights. President Manangakwa, your country has one of the leading programs in community-based natural resource management, Campfire, it's world famous. Even the program in Namibia is in a way schooled and styled after your program in Zimbabwe, and we have enormous respect and recognition for that. So what, what do you think is the future of this rights issue? Will the program survive if the rights are continuously eroded and obstructed by international processes? Well, let me say I support the views already expressed by my colleagues. But your question is a bit problematic. The balancing of rights between the people and animals. I think the people side understand their rights. I'm not sure whether the animal side know the rights which are limited or any derogation of their rights. Because in my view, let's look at the lion. The lion have a right to eat the type of meat naturally it was created to eat, including people. <laughs> so we must create an environment where we constrain the lion to eat anything she eats or she thinks she must or he must eat. This is why we create national parks, so that we cannot allow the lion to exercise its right to eat people. <laughs> Let it eat other animals. The second issue, question of balancing. People grow in terms of population. Animals grow in terms of population. The land which we occupy, the land which the animals occupy, does not grow. So time comes when the people want to expand their, to expand their space. Time comes when the animals also want to expand their space. Conflict arises. This is why in Zimbabwe we have campfire program. We would want to limit this conflict. But to succeed, we need to have a model of management which is acceptable to us and other participants in CITES where 
we find a way of limiting animals to the space provided for them, like in Zimbabwe. Twenty-six percent of our land is for animals. I do not see us expanding that to thirty percent or forty percent, because also the population is expanding, and I don't want to see. I wouldn't want to see also ourselves expanding and eating into the space we have already put aside for animals. So that's the balance perhaps we must create. But for that to continue to remain constant, we need, it's not easy for the animals to regulate us on production. But it is easier for us to regulate the animals on production by allowing us to trade in animals so we can feed into other areas where there is no animals, where there are no animals. But the convince is not there. The animals cannot sell us anywhere. It's, we can, it's only us who can sell them. <laughs> so it is my sincere belief that this balance you are talking about is something we all must look at it and uh, find a compromise. And we need to be capacitated to implement that solution. Left alone, currently in Zimbabwe, we have an excess of over 30,000 elephants. What do we do with them? They will continue to grow. But as the, that population grows more and more and more, the conflict will increase. So we say to the organization, let us not have one rule for every situation. Let us adjust to concrete situation existing in Southern Africa. I thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We are essentially out of time, so I think our last speaker um, will be President Lungu um, on this issue. We won't get to the investment, but the presidents have already touched on the whole issue of investment. And I'm, I know them. They are some of the strongest champions um, for investment in all of the sectors, and I'm very sure also in the tourism and the wildlife economy. And I'm so happy that we heard a very good presentation earlier about what is really needed from an investment perspective. And some really important truths were, were spoken there. So I think that's that topic we can, we can leave for another time. So President Lungu, I've recently met your um, communities who uh, are involved in community-based natural resource management, young people, very brilliant people. How do you look at the rights of communities? I think he, from the onset, let me just make it very clear. The rights of human beings and communities is paramount to us as government, as leaders of the people. Let's make no bones about it. But have we got the capacity, as we promote wildlife economy, to protect those rights, and community rights and individual rights? I think that's the big question to deal with. So if we're going to say, Yes, wildlife is a source of uh, economic growth and benefit to our people. Then we should have a mechanism for protecting our people, ameliorating their suffering when their fields are eaten by the, the, the wildlife. Uh, when, 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 in fact, the incidentally, the incidents where they are killed by elephants, buffaloes, and all these things, we should take it as our responsibility to protect those people, because it's us who have identified wildlife as a source of economy and growth. And if we're not going to take that responsibility, then we shouldn't even be talking about this economy. We have failed to manage it. So we should have a mechanism wherein we'll be able to protect our humanity, our human beings, uh, communities, and everyone, including their fields. And if we don't have that responsibility, then we are not worth talking about wildlife economy. That's my view. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't want to even summarize or anything like that, except for me, the message is very clear. 
The Excellencies, the Presidents of these four countries, are eager to hear more from us about what this New Deal could mean. Your Excellencies, the communities have also spoken on their way to on its way to you is also an important declaration that they worked on yesterday, where I think you will also see their level of commitment um, and their willingness to be equal partners in, in all of this process. So I want to really thank you. Eu tentei falar um bocado em língua inglesa, mas a voz não foi audível o suficiente. E quero agradecer a paciência dos nossos presidentes aqui, enquanto represento também o presidente da República de Angola, o João Manuel Gonçalves Lourenço, dizer que o engajamento a nível do reconhecimento das comunidades é supra porque neste momento realizou-se ou terminou a reunião das, com as autoridades a nível nacional. E a posição e o reconhecimento, quer a nível dos blocos regionais em África e em particular da SADEC, com a visão estratégica da União Africana, é o que prevalece ainda até agora. Para Angola, reserva-se de que muito dos, alguns dos erros que nós vimos na nossa região hoje a serem retificados e olhando para um futuro próspero comum, Vamos continuar engajados naquilo que é a visão comum para a nossa região, mas até lá gostaríamos de aqui reafirmar que, assim como a Arca de Noé foi feita, Angola é, neste momento, o caso específico para sermos a Arca de Noé da região da SADEC e também do Ocasa ou do Ocavango. Pela quantidade de recursos naturais que temos, partilhados, pelas áreas de conservação transfronteiriças e por tudo quanto foi já aqui dito, sem haver replicidade, mas reafirmar que vamos continuar engajados e também uh, do esforço é a abertura para reduzir a pressão aqui nos nossos países de podermos ter os corredores livres de minas e facilitar um pouco mais a migração. Como parte da solução, Angola presente neste fórum. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you, everybody. I believe the session is now closed, and the next item will be introduced by the facilitator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, the moderator. I want to thank our principals. Uh, we got a matching order now, and uh, also our takeaway here is that sustainable utilization of our wildlife, our natural resources, is God's instruction. So we must just uphold that God's instruction. Thank you very much, and um, I want to call upon the, um, the director of ceremonies for household, housekeeping. Thank you. I think the the Excellencies deserve a, a round of applause for taking our questions, for engaging us in such a, an open manner, and, and clearly for clearly articulating the issues before us. Your Excellencies, heads of state and government here present, the Honorable Ministers, distinguished guests, this brings us to the end of the morning session. I want to, I'm humbled and want to thank the heads of state and government for sitting through. We did not have a tea break, as you noticed, but they sat through with us. Your Excellencies, thank you very much. We will proceed as following with your indulgence, Your Excellencies. We will ask Your Excellencies to kindly Proceed ahead of us. We, you may wish to take 10 minutes break, Your Excellencies, perhaps in your rooms, to freshen up a bit before you proceed to lunch at Victoria Falls Hotel, as we shall guide and direct which direction we will take. 
You will be received there by His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Zimbabwe, His Excellency E.D. Mnangagwa. As the heads of states leave, I will just kindly request that we will stand and then we'll proceed as follows. I will ask the honorable ministers who are in the room to immediately proceed. There is a room that has been set aside and you will be guided by protocol and other liaison officers in safari suits. They will show you where you will join the, the rooms that you will be going to. There will also be lunch at Victoria Falls Hotel for the rest of the delegates who are here. We have coaches that we have arranged. They are just outside the gate of Elephant Hills. So I will kindly ask that we go to those coaches as soon as possible, proceed and allow the heads of states to then follow after we have gone. There will also be some lunch served here. Uh, let me